Hi everybody, this is Dr. Ozzy with the Functional Medicine Wellness Center. Uh, we've had a few requests to talk about uh, functional blood chemistry analysis. So this is something we do with uh, all our patients that come in for a wellness visit. Uh, we look at physical st uh, structural issues, we look at chemical issues, which are again BOE blood, uh, urine, saliva, and then we're going to look at uh, mental emotional, and this is the, the chemical uh, part that has to do with functional blood chemistry analysis. If you go to my website, you can uh, look at the blog that will tell you uh, the difference is between this typical uh, blood work analysis from your primary care that's looking for pathology or disease, uh, and then what we do, which is looking for uh, normal function and then dysfunction, and then lastly, you'll see uh, disease. So let's go through this so people can see it. This is just someone we picked from the office. And uh, I'll be blurting out numbers. If we see on the right-hand side, we have the reference ranges uh, right in here that um, we'll, we'll see from the typical uh, office that you're going to. So that will do a little disclaimer here. When we see these numbers, these are coming from the average person going to this particular lab. And oddly or sadly enough, this changes from lab to lab because it's based off the, the population going there. So who goes to a lab? Uh, people who don't feel well, that's why they're going typically. So the sicker the population going to this particular lab, and this is anywhere in America, the larger and the wider and the reference ranges become. And in reality, the more useless they become in my thought process. <laughs> and so uh, we want to narrow those down and go, okay, what's this normal function? I don't care if you live in Canada, Europe, you know, Mexico, Texas, where we're at, <laughs> uh, or anywhere, what are those normal numbers and healthy physiology, not right next, next door to disease, right? So again, we'll crunch those numbers, and if I spit those out, those numbers, and you hear them, they don't jive with this, that's functional numbers. Those typically come from uh, the American Association of Clinical Chemists, uh, and then also just uh, clinical uh, information over, you know, years and years and years of, of looking at blood work from numerous different docs. So uh, let's take a look here. Glucose, we want 85 to 100, so this person's 79. So we would start asking questions like, do you get, uh, do you eat breakfast? Uh, do you get the shakes or lightheaded or grouchy, right? Like the Snickers commercial, uh, when you don't eat because this is again a little low. Now it's one pinprick in time, and this is super important to note. We look at a hemoglobin A1C because most people are going to look decent uh, at seven in the morning or eight in the morning or whenever this was taken and they were fasting because they haven't eaten. And so unfortunately, medically, we might look at this and go, oh, wow, you're awesome, right? And we kind of neglect what they are on average. So. A hemoglobin A1C is like taking a pinprick of your blood for like the last three months. So it gives you an average. So it's not perfect, but it's better than if you just took this number here. And so um, if we looked at this 5.1, it's probably coming more up around, you know, 100 um, or slightly over 100 on average. And there's a big difference between this one and that one because of that. Uh, and then what we'll see is this person might, feel like, hey, I kind of bounce around all day, where sometimes I'm, um, um, you know, got foggy headedness, or I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, zoning out a little bit, I have insulin spikes, I'm up and down, uh, because, you know, we might have some highs and lows throughout the day, and, and we don't want that. We kind of want this number more about 4.9, uh, would be better, maybe 4.8, and that gives us that 85 to 100 range. So continuing on, we might look at uric acid. So right here, you may have some symptoms uh, going on, but you're, and this is the problem, and your doc is just going to cruise right by this, and they're not even going to do a hemoglobin A1C because that's actually for someone who has diabetes, and they're looking to see, well, how you're managing your diabetes. So again, we use it because it's just a good functional test to see where are you most of the time, right? Uh, so... Continuing on, uric acid, three to six. So if we get a little higher, uric acid is getting built up. Maybe we've got, you know, a little bit too much protein. Maybe we've got extra acid in our body. Our kidneys are just having a difficult time 
you know, processing and getting rid of stuff. And so it's starting to build up. If uric acid gets too high, sometimes we'll, we'll hear about um, gouty arthritis. That's where the big toe really just painfully hurts you, right? 7.1, you know, we're getting up there pretty close to it. Blood, urine, nitrogen, uh, again, um, uh, liver, kidneys, 13 to 18, we're okay at 14. A little low, sometimes we start thinking of B6 need. Creatinine, again, kidney marker, also uh, a little bit of muscle mass, 0.7 to 1.1. Uh, filtration rate to the kidneys is good, above 100. Um, sodium, 135 to 140, 4 to 4.5, 100 to 106. So sodium potassium chloride, a lot of times sodium potassium chloride are really good to look at and see what's going on with our adrenals. So when we look at that, we might say this is normal, but this is a little low, and this is definitely low, medically low 96. Usually if chloride's getting low, we're, we're typically um, using or dumping a lot of chloride out of the system, and that's, that's usually when our body is pretty tanked and, and uh, pretty tired, maybe adrenal fatigue. And then we start asking those questions to the patient. Uh, is that happening? And if they're like, yeah, that's exactly what's happening. Okay, well, we're under some adrenal challenges. Maybe we want to take that a little deeper. We'll do a saliva test to look at adrenals. Uh, or, you know, we're want to look, wanting to look and go, well, what's bothering my adrenals? Because my adrenals just sit on top of my kidneys and then my fight or fight land. I'm going to fight or I'm going to run away. So a lot of times docs will jump on adrenals, 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 and we want to treat them. And if you don't, uh, understand physiology and looking at, well, why are they stressed? Because they're just reacting to the stress. You don't find that out. You'll be treating the adrenals seven days a week, 24 seven for the rest of your life. And you're still not, you know, you're using functional medicine, but you're not actually, you know, addressing the underlying problem, which really is functional medicine. So we're just kind of playing a bit, right? So we really always want to ask why, 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 why? And again, at some point you may need to support the adrenals anyways, just to get them out of trouble but you're also constantly looking to see, well, why are they stressing? Okay, uh, carbon dioxide, definitely 25 to 30. We're pretty low at 21. We're starting to get uh, acidic. Uh, when we see that 20 is medically low, so two points away from being medically low in the flag at 19. So a lot of times we're getting a little too acidic. And again, people may be real sore, they go for a workout and they say, yeah, you know, I can never recover anymore right? My kidneys get rid of 90% of my acid. Um, again, I'm tired and I'm fatigued and get foggy headed because I might not be, you know, uh, uh, exchanging oxygen to my tissue as well because I'm holding on to it in the blood because my blood kind of get acidic and on and on and on. So these are the things we may see. And so we can start to address that. Um, calcium 9.2 to 10.1 or 9.6. Phosphorus 3.5 to 4. And uh, when we look at that, uh, a nice 10 to 4 ratio is actually good. Calcium and phosphorus, good buffers of acid. So we see that dropping and we start wondering, are we robbing Peter to pay Paul? Right? Um, these are one of the reasons on top of uh, estrogens why ladies may start getting osteoporosis. And it has, again, less to do with estrogen and more to do with their robbing Peter to pay Paul. Magnesium, 2 to 2.5. Magnesium is in about 1,000 different reactions chemically in your body. It's a pretty big deal. Uh, and so we could have a lot of symptoms from the fact that this is getting low. Protein, 6.9 to 7.4. Albumin, 4 to 5. 2.4 to 2.8 for globulin. It's all looking good. Uh, these ratios are good. LDH is good, 140 to 180. AST, ALT, anything that works really hard, AST, um, brain, heart, liver, kidneys, you know, very metabolically active, liver, ALT, typically 10 to 26, we're coming up a bit there. Oh, GGT, sometimes a good in, in uh, looking at uh, indicator of sort of glutathione status, the number one intracellular antioxidant of the body, it's a big deal. Um, so we wanna make sure that's okay. Continuing on, Ferritin is our storage level of iron. It's kind of our best way to look to see if you're iron anemic, not really iron here. Uh, closer to 100 would be nice. So this person's again low. So if we're starting to think, hey, I'm lethargic and I'm tired and, and all that. Again, if you're noticing this, hopefully you're getting the picture from a functional standpoint. 
this person was probably taught these told this first page and a half hey you're awesome see ya and they're literally in my office going i feel terrible and so you can start to see well yeah you probably do feel terrible you're not at pathology yet so let's not let you get there but yeah your body's starting to dysfunction right so again there's normal physiology a long list typically of dysfunction or years of dysfunction and then disease so prevent prevention especially it drives me nuts we start talking in medicine we'll start saying oh come in and have your prostate checked and whatever by the time there's tissue damage done you've had a problem for a long time and there when we look at these numbers and especially blood it's the most stable fluid in your body if this is changing even subtly it means it's been changing for quite some time right and then again by the time the tissue's been destroyed enough that you can see it on an mri or an x-ray or whatever uh there's a major problem and so again that's not really prevention prevention is looking at it functionally and going hey they're building the soil to create a problem let's stop it now before it gets there it's a lot easier to stay out of trouble then get out of trouble. So we do this in our office all day long. We can do this for you online. Get your blood work done. You get to do it through, do it through us. You can get it done through your primary care physician. And we can start making plans uh, to start helping your body repair the soil. So, because healthy soil, healthy plant. Healthy soil, healthy person, right? Healthy body inside. All right, cholesterol, not too bad, you know, 150 to 160 to 200. We don't want it too low. We see a lot of men come in. They've been on a statin forever in a day. It's at 100, and they feel awful. And yes, because cholesterol is there for a reason. God put everything there for a reason. You want it too, too low or too high. Cholesterol makes estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, aldosterone. It's all a precursor to steroid hormones. So... If you can't make testosterone in your guy, you typically get kind of grouchy, right? Don't feel like a man. And guess what we have popping up all over the place? The low T center, right? And maybe you don't have a low T problem. Maybe you just can't make it because cholesterol's low. And there's a bunch of other stuff, but you get the picture. And that's not to say you might not need a med someday. Maybe you do need some testosterone. Maybe a lady does, right? But maybe that should, maybe you don't. Maybe that's the last thing that you need and things like this need to be fixed because it's always best for your body to take care of you. The best person to balance your hormones is you. And if you can't do that, then yes. And that's just one thing that we're looking at. Okay. Off the soap uh, box here. Okay. Triglycerides should be about half of the cholesterol. Uh, it's a low. Um, HDL considered the good cholesterol, a quarter of the total. LDL is coming up, really 120 or below would be nice. A TH, uh, total cholesterol, the good cholesterol below three. So those aren't, you know, they're not perfect ratios. Uh, and again, we'd probably start implementing some things uh, that would support that really with some of the stuff that would support the acid on the previous page would also probably help this. Cholesterol, uh, think of it like um, uh, sometimes if you have a pothole in the uh, road, you repave it. Cholesterol acts a little like that. If you've got an inflammatory process, it's trying to dampen it down. That's why you'll take cholesterol. The LDL puts the cholesterol in the arteries. HDL takes it out. That's why it gets a good and a bad name. But the question really should be, again, why? Why would I be putting it in there instead of just stopping it? Typically, you're putting it in there because you're inflamed. So... It's a problem because it's a circle and eventually it's going to clog up. But wouldn't it be better to address the problem, which is inflammation, not typically a deficiency in a drug that decreases cholesterol? Just saying. But if you need it, the med, okay. Continuing on, if we haven't done a functional blood chemistry analysis, we don't know. C-reactive protein inflammation highly specific it's got a benefit to look cardiovascular wise we want it below one 
average risk for cardiovascular event to one to three. She's this person here is 2.6, three. So we'd want to work on that. Again, inflammation, right? Maybe we've got that going on here. So we're with this, this gets better. This is kind of nice about fixing problems. A lot of times you fix a problem and 10 symptoms get better, which is kind of cool because you spend less money on medication and you feel better. All right, or you could spend less money. TSH, thyroid simulating hormone, 1.8 to 3.0, looks pretty good. This is typically the only thing that gets looked at when you're with your medical practitioner. This is just basically your brain telling your thyroid to do something. I often tell my patients, especially if they have kiddos, this is like telling your kid to go here and clean their room. And you don't look at these guys, which means you didn't actually go to their room to see if they did anything. How many times have you told your kids to go do clean the room? They say, yeah, you bet, I cleaned it. And no, they didn't. So if you just do the TSH, you really have no idea if your thyroid did anything. It's one way to go. It's not the way I would go. I would want to know. That's just me. So now we look at T4, the inactive uh, thyroid hormone, 6 to 12. There's 7.3, pretty groovy. Uh, T3 uptake, looking a little low. As you can see, medically low is 24. We're getting here at 24. T3 uptake is like kind of like a lock and key. Get that T3 in there. So again, the story, got to make it. You got to tell it to do something. Then you got to do it. You got to have to have all the precursors, the vitamins and the minerals to do it. Then you got to transport it. Then you got to convert it. And then you got to get it in. Lock and key. So this person is being told to do it. This person is making it. And if we stopped here, they may feel kind of funky. 300 symptoms, 300 plus symptoms with a low thyroid or a thyroid that's not normally kind of functioning as far as physiology goes. And the thyroid looks like it's doing its job, but it's not getting in the tissue. Sometimes the tissue is the issue because it doesn't get in there. And there's lots of things that can gunk up that receptor. So this person may feel lethargic and tired and brain fog, and, and they do, uh, and it gets missed, and it's right here. Thyroid is also involved almost always loss of a major metabolic hormone, one of the main things that's always involved in all forms of cancer. So we really don't want to screw, pardon my French, with your thyroid. We want it functioning. Cancer is kind of a big deal. All right. Continuing on, 1.8, free thyroxin index. It's okay. Could be a little better. Medically low vitamin D. I think it's 2 billion. Don't quote me on that, but it's pretty close to 2 billion people worldwide are deficient in vitamin D. Might want to get that checked. Very important. We want it closer to 90. It's involved uh, in your immune system inversely proportional to autoimmunity. Lower the vitamin D, increased inversely proportional to autoimmunity. Low thyroid, increased your chances of autoimmunity. Also, inversely proportional to mortality, death. Low vitamin D, increased your chance of death. Not good. So we want to get that up. After about age 40, you don't make as much vitamin D from the sun. Something to think about. And most people today, they slap so much sunscreen on, they wouldn't get any sun even if they tried. And you need to be about 40% of your body. This has got to be open to the sun. So if you're walking out there with pants and t-shirt on, good luck. You're not going to get enough. All right. Moving right along, white blood cells, medically high. Usually means acute uh, infection. Let's look down, that's the name of the company, immune system, Google, Facebook, whoever. Let's pick another company, I don't know, Air Canada. 
all that. You go outside the country here. American. People who work for the company, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils all have a job description. Typically kill bacteria, typically kill viruses. Monocytes are like first responders, look like Marines. They go in there, kick everyone's butt, and then kind of get in there and clean up debris. Eosinophils, allergies, and parasites. Allergies, heavy metals. Limps, absolutely high, medically high. So we look at this person, even though if we didn't see this, well, this looks okay, but 40 to 60, 25 to 40. We would say, hey, this is, again, medically high. Maybe they've got a viral pattern going on acutely. And we'd want to address that. Or let's see their body maybe kicks it out themselves. Who knows? RBCs, uh, if it was a lady, 3.9 to 4.5, 4 to 5 for guys, a little high, maybe dehydrated. They haven't drank before they went to this, so maybe. So maybe dehydrated. Have to ask those questions and say, hey, how are you feeling? Getting muscle cramps. Brain 77% water. Brain fog. Maybe you're dehydrated. We'd miss it if we just looked at medicine. Okay. 13.5 to 14.5. Looking pretty good. Looking pretty. Lots to do with B vitamins here. They look okay. I don't want to kind of bore you to death with the numbers. Um, and then we look at white blood cells, uh, a little bit abnormal in here. Uh, possibly we might ask questions about a UTI, right? None seen with the bacteria, which is good. Um, but we'd start talking about that. And there's other, other things depending on if this is a lady or a, or a guy. Then pH, getting pretty low, 5.5, right? Maybe acidic. We've talked about that previously. So uh, ride this close from maybe to seven, especially if this is uh, maybe third or fourth morning you're in. Uh, so there you have it. That is it. That is our massive, massive amount of blood work. And from here, there's definitely things on here that are going to make this person not feel well. They also are headed for trouble with some of these things. Uh, acid is another thing. Loss of your body's ability to balance acid, alkaline balance inside and outside the cell. Always involved with all forms of cancer. Toxicity, anaerobic, right? Or aerobic, anaerobic, more, they can become anaerobic, no oxygen to the tissue. These are the things, the building blocks of cancer, right? So, this person doesn't seem to be, I don't think, anywhere near that. However, if they still build the soil, the building, the ground of it, right, they're increasing their chances. One in two men will get diagnosed in their lifetime of cancer. One in three women. So do we really want to start continuing to go down this road? Prevention is worth a you know, ounce of prevention, pound of cure. Easier to stay out of trouble than get out of trouble. Prevention isn't necessarily go see your doc, go do your mammogram, go do your prostate check, but there's going to be disease typically already there. When we look at those, we want to look at function and dysfunction to be preventative, truly preventative. And it starts here. So I'm Dr. Ozzy. I hope that helped. I hope that, you know, maybe if you get your knowledge or you, you absorb your information better with a video, if you like the video, let us know. We can do more. And then uh, make an appointment. We can do this online. We can do it worldwide. Uh, we can go over this, functionalmedicinecenter.com, 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 Dr. Ozzy, Dr. Ozzy, Dr. Ozzy. We're here to help. Uh, have a very blessed day. All right, bye.